Mark Gerardo met his future wife in 1986. They were both teenagers in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and according to an interview he did with 2020 in an episode called The Affair, he first saw Janair when she was working at Taco Bell, and he said that she managed to make that brown polyester uniform look good. He was so intimidated, he didn't even talk to her at first. He waited four years before he saw her again while they were both working at the mall. And even then, he said it was her that made the first move and asked him if he was going to ask her out or what. Well, you know, I will say it's a pretty hot thing to have a girl be on to you like that. I mean, after four years, you think you're being all sneaky and stealth and she knows you're into her. It's really a confidence thing, very much of a turn on. Well, it must have been because they were apparently crazy about each other and Mark and Janair got married on October 23rd, 1993. She was 23 and he was 25, but just 24 years later, he would be asking Janair for a divorce so he could marry his mistress of three months, Meredith Chapman. So stick with us. This is one of those cases that you almost can't help but be enraged by. I'm Chris. And I'm his wife, Amy. And this is True Crime Recaps. Now, one of our most popular YouTube episodes is about Chris Watts' mistress. It had more than 5 million views and thousands of comments. And one of the most common questions we get is why didn't he just divorce Shanann instead of killing her and his children to be with this new woman? Yeah. But interestingly, in the case we're talking about today, Mark Gerardo did ask his wife for a divorce. And it still turned deadly. I'll start at the beginning. After they got married, Mark and Janair both pursued careers in marketing. He was a creative director. And according to her old LinkedIn page, as reported on Heavy.com, Janair worked as a marketing manager, a project manager, and she was even a lease analyst for a realtor. She described herself as confident and a resourceful marketing management professional. So about five years after they got married in 1998, they started their own creative agency in Indianapolis. And it was called Gerardo and Inc., like INC. And he worked as the creative director. She was the marketing and operations manager. They ran that together for about 10 years until the financial meltdown in 2008. And according to what Mark told 2020, that's when everything started to change for them. So between the money stress, the stress of running a business together. Okay, I certainly understand the stress of running a business together with your spouse. I mean, but just like us, they didn't have kids to add to that stress, Uh, which is a good thing. Yes, they were dog parents, just like us. So they had some freedom to make a change, which they really needed. So they closed up shop and started looking for new jobs. And they found their fresh start in Greenville, South Carolina in November of 2011. So Mark got a job as an art director, and Janair was working as a marketing manager, and things were looking up, money-wise, between the two of them. Mark even called their time in South Carolina a renaissance for their marriage. And their Facebook pages made it look like they were the perfect couple. I mean, it was nothing but them posing with their dogs on hikes and all kinds of other outings, calling each other, my lovely wife and my lovely husband. I mean, it looked like a picture-perfect, beautiful life. Yeah, doesn't it always on social media? But it it actually probably was for a little while. But by 2017, things were going downhill again. Janair lost her job, and she was having trouble finding a new one. Okay. And how old was she at this time? She would have been about 45, 46. So I feel like it's harder when you're older to find a new job. You know, when you lose your job at that age, it's really difficult. And I don't want to sound sexist or anything like that, but I think for a woman, it's even more difficult. I mean, I'm not going to disagree. Right? Society has come a long way when it comes to the way women are treated, but girl, you know, it's still rough out there. But for a woman like Janair, a woman who described herself as like confident, resourceful, like take charge, it was probably even worse that when she lost her job and couldn't find a new one, it really just started her on this downward, dark spiral. Yeah. And I mean, this is the time that you really lean on your spouse. I mean, this is the time she really needed Mark the most. Right. And they tried to do what they did before, expand their job search, look at new towns, get a fresh start. And it works, uh, sort of. I mean, Mark got a new job as the creative director at the University of Delaware, but Janair was still floundering. 
And that's where he met Meredith Chapman. Exactly. She was the director of digital communications at the University of Delaware. So she was actually his boss. And she had a lot in common with Janair. They were both marketing professionals. They were both ambitious, confident. They were both attractive. But Meredith was 16 years younger than Janair. And she had a job. She was confident, youthful, beautiful. She had ambition. All the things that attracted Mark to Janair in the first place back when they were kids. Yeah. I mean, clearly that is what he's into because as he told 2020, it only took him about five minutes into his job interview to start thinking of Meredith as all those things, articulate, energetic, passionate, and accomplished. He said he was dumbfounded by her. Dumbfounded? I mean, that does sound a lot like what he felt like when he first met Janair. Yeah. He was pretty clear he was smitten right away. He moved to Wilmington, Delaware to start working for Meredith in November of 2017. Okay. And where is Janair at this point? Well, Janair still hadn't found a job in Delaware. So she hung back in South Carolina to wrap up the loose ends with their house and everything while he went up north alone to start work. He was up there without his wife for about 45 days. Okay. So he's up there starting a new life and becoming acquainted with this beautiful new younger woman and his poor wife is left behind dealing with all the paperwork. I mean, sounds like a drag for her, but it's all going great for him. It was going so great that two weeks after he got to Delaware, he and Meredith went out for drinks. And according to him, she was so easy to talk to that drinks turned into dinner. And he even said that very first time out felt like a date. You know, I have to say, whenever you use the line, like, it's it's so easy to talk to you, that feels like a pickup line. I mean, I wouldn't say that to a friend if I were out having a beer with him, even if he was easy to talk to. <laughs> That's a good point. The thing is that it's interesting <clears throat> that you say that because as he even said to 2020, the thing that was so easy to talk to her about was because she was complimenting him. She kept saying how amazing he was, how talented he was. And he hadn't heard that from his wife in a while. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, look, you and I have been married for a long time, about as long as they were. And I mean, after a certain point, you don't always need to have your ego stroked 24-7. I mean, I would. I do love you. You're amazing. Please don't leave me for another woman. No, I know that, but I don't need to hear it all the time. Well, it only took Mark and Meredith four weeks to start sleeping together. So clearly he did need to hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. And she was also married. She'd been in her relationship for nine years. But by the time Janair joined Mark in Delaware, only 45 days after he moved there, her husband was already exchanging I love yous with another woman. Well, that went down the tubes rather quickly. And of course, Janair could sense that something was off because they'd known each other since they were kids. So she immediately suspected that he was having an affair with Meredith. Yeah, but how did she know it was her right away? Because he'd been talking about her pretty much since he'd started. I mean, not in a romantic way, but in a she's such an incredible boss. She's such an incredible marketing professional. She's just so incredible so, kind of way. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, his wife, who is also a marketing person, can't even find a job. Yeah, exactly. But when she asked him flat out if he was having an affair with Meredith, he denied it. And for Janair, that denial, it seemed to act as sort of a trigger that set off this deadly obsession to find out the truth. Well, it seems like at that point she knew he was lying and she had nothing else going on. I mean, she had no job. They had no kids. She could sense her life partner was pulling away from her and it Sounded like she turned all that energy and intelligence into finding out every last detail about their affair. Exactly. It became basically her full-time job. She literally put him under NSA-level surveillance. NSA? That's yeah. the agency. NSA-level surveillance. I mean, he didn't know it at the time, but she cloned his phone so she could read his texts and see the pictures that he and Meredith were sending back and forth. And once she saw all those I love yous and I can't live without yous, that is when mentally she started breaking apart. She put GPS tracking devices on his car and Meredith's. She labeled his lying jerk and Meredith's was named whore. Okay, but I have a question now. How did she buy all this gear without him knowing? I mean, I have to assume they still had some kind of joint bank accounts going on, right? I mean, 
she's not working. Isn't he wondering where his paycheck is going? Well, she actually opened up a secret bank account and credit card. So he really had no clue that he didn't go anywhere she didn't know about. He couldn't make a move without her tracking him. She actually bought a lock picking kit, computer hacking software, DNA testing kits for his clothes. I don't even know what those are. And listening devices. She was sewing them into the lining of his jackets so she could listen in on conversations he was having with Meredith when he and Meredith were like face to face in person. And later he discovered 12 notebooks filled with transcriptions of the conversations that she was recording. I'm beginning to think this whole situation would have turned out differently if he had just told her the truth about Meredith when she asked the first time or if, you know, he didn't do anything in the first place with her. Yes. Totally. But now she does have all this information and she confronts him with it right around Valentine's Day in 2018. Of course, obviously, she's got all this stuff. He has no choice but to say, OK, I'm having an affair. So they decide to go to counseling. But he keeps seeing Meredith. So why go to counseling if you're just going to keep having an affair? Well, Mark himself admitted that he and Janair probably, quote, had different goals for counseling, as in she wanted to save the marriage and he was hoping to use those sessions to convince her to go quietly. Although it, he didn't actually say that to her before their first session, but he must have known that Janair would still know that he, if he was still seeing Meredith since she already had all this information, but he didn't know at that time how she was actually getting it. But it didn't matter as they didn't get that far along in counseling. When he was on his way to meet her for their second session, he discovered the listening device. It was sewn into the lining of his jacket. And that was it for him. He told her he wanted a divorce. Oh, my God. That that must have sent her over the edge. I mean, she just moved up to Delaware to be with him in mid-January and right away discovered he was in love with another woman. She doesn't have a job. She doesn't know anyone in this new city. And now... Only a few months after they were supposed to be starting a new life together in Delaware, her husband tells her he wants a divorce so he can be with this new, younger woman. But wait a minute. Wait. What about Meredith's husband? Well, Janair told him about the affair and Meredith didn't deny it. She told him, yes, she was in love with Mark. She wanted a divorce and they were moving along that process amicably. Okay, so Mark wanted the same thing. He, He just wanted a nice, easy kind of friendly divorce so he didn't have to deal with any confrontation. Yeah, which is fair, I guess. When you have this new life that you want to get to, you do want a nice, easy divorce. But Janair, she wasn't about to let him get off that easy. And she had a couple of months to set up a plan for revenge. He asked for a divorce in mid-March 2018, but he couldn't make it official until he met Delaware's residency requirements, which wouldn't be until May So as far as I can tell, he and Janair were still living together, even after he asked her for a divorce. Why wouldn't he just move out and live with Meredith? I mean, yes, that's a good question. I have to assume like he was probably staying with Meredith off and on, but I don't know. Meredith was going through some life changes of her own. She was in the middle of her own divorce. She had actually changed jobs and she moved about 45 minutes away to a place called Radnor Township in Pennsylvania. She was working at Villanova University and Mark was still working at the University of Delaware and he needed to maintain his residency in that state in order to get a divorce. Plus, Janair couldn't afford the rent on her own since she didn't have a job. So maybe he thought he was being nice by trying by staying there when in actuality he it, things were only getting worse. Yeah, but that just seems kind of delusional. I mean, especially considering all the surveillance she had going on him. Yeah. And the surveillance thing wasn't all. She was threatening suicide. She threatened to jump out a window and kill herself. She was absolutely going to this very dark place at the idea of a divorce. So Mark suggested that she see a divorce coach and a therapist. So according to 2020, this divorce coach said, "Yes, Janair was resentful about, in her words, being thrown away by being traded in for this younger model. And she was concerned about how she was going to be able to support herself since she still could not find a job. And she felt like she was getting older and her life was over. Well, you know, I really can't say I blame her for feeling that way. I mean, you know, it's it's such a sad situation. It's like she's being abandoned after all those years. 
I, I mean, it, it sounds like she was going through some kind of PTSD or something. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, but on the surface, she was trying to keep it together in front of Mark. He actually believed it. He thought she was starting to accept the idea and they could split up and keep it civil and maybe even stay friendly. Yeah, but, you know, I don't understand the purpose of trying to keep it together in front of him at this point. I mean, why not just let it all fly? Yeah, well, there was a reason for that fake accepting attitude. She was masking the fact that she had already decided she wasn't going to go quietly. So Mark actually went on Dr. Oz in October of 2019 to talk about this case. And part of his interview included a conversation with a psychotherapist who studies homicide in marriages. And according to that doctor, listening to those tapes actually sort of gave Janaire the ability to be a fly on the wall of this affair, hearing and seeing everything triggered her rage and, quote, made her believe she was right and he was bad. And the moment when she started to express these suicidal thoughts, that's when she was the most dangerous. That's the tipping point. She made herself the judge and jury in this scenario. And ultimately the executioner. Yeah, but Mark said he believed that she'd gotten through the worst. Even when Janair brought him this list of requests for him in these weeks leading up to their divorce, she he was still hoping that they were on a path to ending things. But the strange part was this list of things that she wanted from him were not divorcey things. They weren't trying to settle alimony or anything. She wanted to go to restaurants, dinner with him. She wanted to go on hikes. She was basically asking him to continue dating her, his and, wife. Okay, and he did those things with her? I mean, he went on these dates and yeah. still kept on seeing Meredith? Yeah. According to 2020, Mark's quote actually was, thought it was strange, but if I wanted to leave her in a good place and if this was what she needed, then I was going to do that. Well, you know, I mean, at that point, it kind of turns into this vicious cycle where she's just, you know, in a distraught situation going after what she wants. And he's trying to have an amicable divorce or whatever. And she knew he was still seeing Meredith and he wasn't changing his mind about this divorce. So she kept up this appearance, this game. But what he didn't know was that when he told her he wanted a divorce, she bought a gun. She was practicing shooting with it at a shooting range at least three days a week while he was at work. So he didn't know. She used these secret credit cards to rent a Cadillac and she drove to Radnor Township to scope out Meredith's new house. She even bought a trench coat, a hat, sunglasses, binoculars, a wig. So listen, this is where it feels like there's a line is being crossed. I mean, the moment you buy a gun, is it's kind of like that tipping point where you sort of give yourself permission for other possibilities. Absolutely. And on the night of April 23rd, 2018, she put those possibilities into motion. She told Mark she was going to meet him for dinner so they could talk about the divorce details since he was planning to file at the beginning of May, but she didn't show up at the restaurant. And then Mark started to get a series of text messages from her. The first one said she was running late. The second text told him to go home and she wasn't coming after all. And then the third text was just a picture. It was a picture of a used condom in a trash can. And when he saw that picture, he started to panic. Yeah, he's panicking because he can recognize that the picture is coming from inside Meredith's house. I would be completely creeped out if I saw that. Uh, Yeah, it's like that horror movie, like the phone call is coming from inside the house. Total freak out. Then she sent a fourth text and it said, you ruined my life. She sent another text that said, I hope you never find happiness. And the last text Janair ever sent said only, by Mark. And do you think that Mark at that point knew what was being planned, what she was going to do? I mean, I don't. does your head go straight to like she's murdering somebody? Probably, probably not, but I'm sure you thought something dramatic was going down. Yeah. So... Especially because Meredith and Janair weren't answering his calls. So he drove to Meredith's house because obviously that's where the picture came from. And when he walked in, he knew he was too late. While he was at the restaurant, Janair had broken into Meredith's house, waited until she got home around 7 o'clock, and then she shot her in the kitchen and then killed herself. Okay. I mean, not that anyone should have gotten shot in this scenario. I I mean, it's a complete tragedy, but I I just have to ask, I mean— why shoot Meredith and not Mark? 
Well, she actually, she was planning to shoot him too. That was her plan B if he had come into the house before Meredith. And we know that because Janair emailed a 15-page letter to Mark and her family, like detailing exactly what she was planning to do and why. This letter was basically a suicide note and sort of part journal. She started writing it when he first asked for a divorce and she was dating her entries. And the whole letter hasn't been published, but this is a partial quote from it that really explains where her head was at. She wrote, quote, they cannot get away with destroying my life for their gain. My life and soul are broken. I am not even a shell of the person I once was. Wow, that is quite a story, honey. I love you. Don't kill me. (laughs) Don't worry. No one is leaving the circle of love, and that goes for all of you out there, too. Which reminds me, do we have time for a listener story? Oh, yeah. Always. Okay. This one comes from Nicole Black Rudolph, and I should warn you, it's pretty horrific. I want to read it as Nicole told it to us, and there are a few places where the description is graphic, so consider yourself warned. This happened in Ames, Iowa on May 29th, 1989. Her father was jogging on the country roads around their family farm when he discovered a freshly decapitated human head. The victim was a 20-year-old girl named Jennifer Ann Gardner. At first, the sheriff thought it was related to satanic ceremonies. But it was later discovered that the murder was actually committed by a 17-year-old named Reuben Desis. Now, he was one of four brothers, and Jennifer was the oldest brother's live-in girlfriend. On May 28th, her boyfriend was out of town, but the other three brothers were with Jennifer at the apartment. They got into some kind of disagreement, and the three of them decided Jennifer needed to die. After some conversation about who should do it, Reuben strangled her to death. Then, according to his younger brother, who was 14 at the time, Reuben had sex with her body. In an effort to try and keep her from being identified, they decapitated her and left her head in the ditch where Nicole's father found it the next day. And Jennifer's body was found in a lake a few days later. Nicole's father had to go to court and testify. Reuben was up for parole in 2019 because he was a juvenile when he was sentenced, so they didn't give him life. But luckily, he was resentenced and will be serving another 11 years before he's eligible for parole. God. But... How about her, what happened with her father? Like, how did how do you move on from something like that? Because I got to tell you, I would never talk again. Yeah. According to Nicole, when he first saw it, he thought it was part of a float from a big parade that Iowa State University has every year in the first week of May. She also said her dad was an avid runner. And for some reason that day, he chose a different path than he normally ran. Uh, he said something pulled him in that direction. That is incredible. I mean, honestly, if he hadn't done that, if he hadn't decided to run that different path, Jennifer might have been left out there with no one to find her. She would not have gotten the justice that she did get if she might not have been able to be identified. That's, oh, that's just, that's amazing. Thank you so much for writing in with your story, Nicole. If you have a story you want to share, please email us at hello at truecrimerecaps.com or just send us a message on Instagram or Facebook. You can watch us tape this podcast every Wednesday on YouTube at True Crime Recaps or listen and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Take care. Bye. Bye.